I am battling my voice still, so if you can bear with me, I'd appreciate it. A lot of individuals have been asking about Kara, and she uh, still has COVID. She's feeling better. Hopefully, she'll get to come home mid part of this week. If not, she'll delay her flight and then come back after that. So we're just trying to work through this. We also have a few of our church members that are ill right now and not feeling well, so couldn't be here this morning. So let's pray for them too. Some of them have kind of like the cold that I have. Some others have COVID as well. It's coming back somewhat. Good news is a milder case than what we saw a while back. So if you'd be in prayer for them, that would be, that would be wonderful. Also, I want to uh, remind you that as we serve as a church, we have a great opportunity to serve this Saturday as we have the chief of police coming to our church to participate in a breakfast, a community breakfast that we have put together uh, as service to our community. And we've heard from a lot of people that have said they're going to come to the church. We'll see if they will or not. All we can do is make it available. But I would ask you, when you see it on social media, send it out, repost it, post it yourself, invite people here. We want to support the chief. In a world that is against law enforcement right now in many ways, let's be different. Let's support law enforcement. They represent the laws that we have enacted as a community. Let's not let a few bad apples ruin it for all law enforcement. So let's support them. We can hold them accountable. Yes, you should. And you'll hear that from the chief. But at the end of the day, we have a great police department here in town. We have one of our officers here today. We have family members in policing. And we have a great chief that tries to do things for the right reason. So that'll begin at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. And then the chief will give his update uh, sometime around 8.30 or 8.40. It's open to everyone. Just show up, have a great time. And we're really looking forward to meeting individuals. And one of the things that we need to do as a church, when someone comes in our church as a visitor, let's wrap our arms around them, make sure they understand that they are welcome to this church. Not just on a Saturday, but on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, anytime our doors are open. Amen? And let's make sure they understand that we are a church that serves we're a church that studies scriptures, and we're a church that's focused on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our, that's our motive as a church. That's our mission, our mantra as a church. All right, before I begin the study of Philippians, I thought it would be important to just look back at the last four weeks as we've talked about the Christian life study. And I have had so many comments and so many people call me about some of the things that you're dealing with in your life and what's going on in the world today that I think that after we get finished with the Philippians study, we're going to dive right back in some other topics. We may take some of the topics that we've already discussed and dig a little bit deeper in those topics. So if, if God's touched your heart and you feel like you have something to say about one of those topics or you'd like to share something in the future, you may want to be involved in a class that helps people get over things like anxiety or dependency issues please come and see me. There's opportunities to serve. And one thing we've been blessed with is we have plenty of room. And so we'll be able to open up our doors to help people through any of these issues. And if you come to me, remember, you may be speaking at a Sunday school class. You may be working on Wednesday night speaking. You may be coming up here and helping me one Sunday morning. But I think we need to really focus on those needs that we have in our community that we can do something about. So we're going to just let the Holy Spirit lead us in that over the next few weeks or months because it's going to take us a little, quite a while to get through Philippians because it's such a rich book in, in what we'll be studying. Now today, let me just tell you that we're going to be in Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 1 and we're going to be 1 through 3. But that's not going to be towards the end of the sermon. And the reason being is whenever we start a new Bible study and we are looking at a book and we're going to go through this book uh, basically verse by verse, chapter by chapter. When we do this type of study, I think it's important to understand kind of the history that's going on at the time. Not only that, but understand the author and the author's background, understand the church that's being written to, the church in Philippi at this time. So I'm going to do both of those this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about Paul. As most of you all know, Paul wrote Philippians. And we're going to talk about the church in Philippi to give you an understanding of Paul's relationship with them before he wrote this letter. And for that relationship, we'll have to go to the book of Acts. But first, let's talk about Paul. Paul was an individual that if you talk to the normal person in the world, they'll know Paul's name and they'll know that he wrote a lot of the books in the New Testament. Some may even know that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
And so while Paul's name is known, not a lot is really known about Paul in today's modern world. So I know many of you here today have studied Paul and studied his background, but I think it's a good time to reflect on his life so we can have a better understanding of the passion that he had as he wrote these letters, especially the letter to the Philippian church. Remember, Paul was not always an apostle of Jesus. That's what surprises people that aren't engaged in studying. He wasn't an apostle of Jesus. He was a persecutor of those that we call Christians, but back then they called the way, persecutors of those in the way. And so he would persecute people, and he did it very well. Uh, Consider Acts 8, verse 3, it says, But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Why was he doing this? Because they were Christians. They professed Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life. And that's what Paul was so upset about. And he was a persecutor of the church. And not just in once in a while, that seemed to be his total dedication. Look at Acts 9, 1 through 2 to give a, a different or another view of Paul as well. And his name was Saul at this time. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, that's Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Men or women, it didn't matter who you were, he was going to persecute you because you believed in Jesus Christ. It's hard to believe when you read Paul's writings that this was his background. But Saul at this time, think about these words, were breathing threats and murders, uh, murder against the disciples. Uh, as you walk in today's world and a Christian walk, and as we've studied in our life series, you're going to have people come against you. But in this country, they're not going to kill you as of yet. They're not going to throw you in prison as of yet. Although I will say there are some recent news stories where individuals have been thrown in prison because they simply prayed to God, usually about abortion. There are instances in other countries where we get a lot of our common law from England where if you walk past an abortion clinic and you keep your head down and you pray silently, you don't stop. You just keep going. The police have actually stopped people to ask them if they're praying to Jesus praying to God, and you know what they'll say? They say, yes, but I'm doing it quietly, and they get arrested because prayer is not allowed. That's happening today in the world. So can we be that far behind? And I will tell you from my time in working in governments and working in a very liberal government, the last place I worked, I can tell you I spoke to individuals that want to limit what pastors can say from the pulpit according to the Scriptures. So we're not that far behind. Don't think that's a a a crazy thought that this could occur because it can occur in the United States of America and we're starting to see signs of it now. But Paul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Simply put, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He was doing it in the name of God and he thought he was right. It's like we talked about when we're talking about truth. We said, You're either going towards the cross or after heresy, you end up going away from the cross, living in apostasy where evil is good and good evil. And that's where Paul is in his life. Evil is good and good is evil. And he is going to do it with the full vigor of his life. He's dedicating his life to destroying those of the way, those individuals that we would refer to as Christians. The reason I think that Paul thought he was so correct is just the force of which he did this, but we also get a, a, a description of Paul in Philippians itself when he gives the Philippian church a reminder of what he was like before he met Jesus. And this is what it says in Philippians 3, 5 through 6. Circumcised on the eighth day, as was custom for Jews, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews... It's like saying he's a man's man. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, Pharisees strictly observed the law. They tried to make sure that every I was dotted and every T was crossed. They tried everything they could to be perfect in all their ways. As to zeal, he says, a persecutor of the church. 
That was his main focus in everything he did. As to righteousness under the law, Paul considered himself blameless. What do you think about that? Blameless. I've never considered myself blameless. But Paul thought he was doing everything according to the law, falling as a Pharisee, had been born a Jew, lived as a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he was going to be the persecutor because that's what he believed God had called him to do. And Paul considered himself blameless, and then he met Jesus and realized how full of blame he should be. For those of you that accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do you remember that first time that the Holy Spirit convicted you and you just knew you were a sinner? And somebody will say, well, how can you explain that? I can't explain it. Some people have heard it from a preacher. I heard it from the gospel music my dad was playing in our home, and it convicted me. I just knew that I knew that I needed a Savior. Paul had that experience, but it was a lot more profound in many ways. Let's read about it. As Jesus confronts Paul on the road to Damascus. Acts 9, verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let me stop here for a moment. Remember we talked about service in Matthew 25 and 31 where it says uh, the least of these? We talked about the greatest of these and least of these and how Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. Because Jesus isn't being persecuted himself, but Paul's persecuting his people. So Jesus looks upon his people as he's being persecuted. It's like if you're close to your spouse and somebody persecutes your spouse, they're persecuting you, aren't they? But this is even deeper because Jesus died for all of us. And when a Christian's being persecuted, he feels as he's being persecuted. And he goes directly to Paul and says, why are you persecuting me? I want you to remember that when you're going through life and people are coming against you and you're trying to have that spiritual backbone we talked about and standing firm, just remember when they persecute you, They're persecuting Jesus. Jesus is right there with you. Jesus is right there with you. And remember what God said to Abraham? They haven't, they haven't refused you. They have refused me. Stand firm. Stand firm. There's hope in that. There's joy in that, as we'll find out from Paul. Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? (laughs) I mean, think about it. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Remember, we just talked about I am I am Jesus, period, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So he was blinded by this interaction with with Jesus. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. I want you to remember that. Three days. Remember Jesus died, buried three days. Didn't eat or drink during that time. And then God goes to a man called Ananias and he tells Ananias to go to Saul. Now let me, let me think about this. If you were told to go to Saul, knowing that he'd been breathing murderous threats, that what the reputation he had, you would be fearful. You would be fearful. And Ananias was too. And he said, he said this in verse 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest, the highest authority in the Jewish religion, to bind all who are called, who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I will show him how much he will suffer for the sake of my name. That describes the rest of his life. And it began with the three days of being blind. You have to think 
in terms of this. Paul is not a good man at this point. He is a persecutor of the church. He exemplifies evil in many ways. But back to Ananias. Ananias, who could have been fearful and was, could have second-guessed this message from Jesus. Doesn't. Verse 17, it says, Ananias departed and entered their house and laying hands on him, he said, look how he greets him. This man that he's fearful of, this man that is not serving God, this man that Jesus has sent to him, he greets him as a brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he rose and was baptized. Three days of suffering, he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. I want you to think about Ananias for a second. Because of his faithfulness, his ability to overcome his own fear, his ability to overcome any lack of understanding he had, why, why in the world would Jesus choose Saul? He simply followed God's will for his life. And because of that, we're blessed even today. Because of the work of Ananias. And as a result, this man, Saul, a persecutor of the church, a person who was feared by Christians, and for good reasons, was saved. Isn't that a wonderful story? God loved him so much that he sent his son for him, and his son intervened, and Saul, the persecutor of the church, who knew all the Old Testament or the books there, he knew all the writings, he memorized most of them, realized that he was speaking. When Jesus was speaking, he was hearing from the Messiah. And he accepted Jesus and was saved. And then what did Paul do? And immediately, Paul proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. How confusing do you think that was to people? And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? and those who called upon his name. And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? Verse 22, listen to this. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was Christ. I love the word confounded because I hear people all the time say that Jesus, when he set me free from whatever it was in their life, when Jesus saved their soul, when they felt this new relationship with Jesus, people couldn't believe the difference in their life. Because all of a sudden they did, as we've been saying, they put the old things away. They had this new knowledge of Jesus and they did what, like Paul did, and they ran towards the cross and people were confounded. And many people, when individuals are born again, many people say, well, it won't last. And unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't last. But for a lot, it does last. And here's what I'll say for us as a church. When we see somebody that has changed their ways or trying to change their ways, and we're confounded, our responsibility is to invest in their life, to help them move forward, to mentor them, and not say, let's wait and see if it sticks. Let's wait and see if, if they get it. Or to be that negative naysayer that says, they're not going to make it. That's not, that's not what God has called us to do. You either believe Jesus or don't. And he, Jesus has said, we are to share the gospel. We are to baptize. And when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, it's our responsibility to lead them and mentor them in the right way. And that will confound people when they see the change that Jesus has made in somebody's life. What a wonderful story of redemption. See, the reason I want to share these stories, I want you to understand the passion from which Paul writes. I want us to understand where he was at one time and how God continues to grow him in his writings and what he's saying to the Philippians and how he stands firm and how he suffers for standing firm. I also want to share Paul in his story because one of the things that I've heard my entire life that I've been a Christian or as it says here, the follower of the way. 
One of the things I've heard my entire life from people, some people that I love is, I can never accept Christ because Christ won't have me. Because I've done too many things evil in this world, there's no way Christ will forgive me for this. I've betrayed my family. I've betrayed my friends. I've betrayed my God. I've done things that are so bad that I just can't be forgiven. And I will just tell you that is a lie from Satan. If God could forgive Paul, he can forgive you. And I'll say this too. You, can, you, may, you may be watching on YouTube. You may be here today and you may say, well, but you just don't understand. I'm even worse than Paul. If you are listening to my voice today, Jesus hadn't given up on you. The Holy Spirit brought you to this place, it's time to make a decision for Christ. Don't worry about the past. Don't worry about how you move forward because when you accept Jesus, not only can you move forward with him, I will promise you, you can move forward with a church that's going to support you, love you, and be there for you. Amen? You mean that church? We want to be there for them. All right. After After meeting Jesus and accepting Jesus, Paul goes from a persecutor to being persecuted. Isn't it, I found this to be true, not 100% true, but I found this to be true in my life. The greatest blessings I've had in my life have been followed by persecution. When, When you have lived a certain way, and you turn, as Paul did, when you've gone from persecutor to follower of Christ, what's Satan going to do immediately? He's going to persecute you. He's going to try to steal that from you. Don't let Satan steal it from you. It's just what to be expected. It's how Satan operates. And that's what happened to Paul. And Jesus said this, he will learn, he'll learn about my suffering. And he did. He went from persecuted, with I don't think a lot of joy in his life at that time, to being the persecuted. What a transformation that happened just like this. Read in verse 23. Many days had passed since the salvation, and Jews plotted to kill Paul. But their plot was known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But Saul eventually escapes. See, those that felt the same way as Saul did felt like he had betrayed them. And what do they do? They want to get, they, they're, they're following uh, the rules of the Pharisees. They're following the rules of the law, and they want to go after Paul, thinking that they're following God's ways. Paul has a new understanding. He immediately preaches Jesus, and immediately they want to kill him. But Paul stands firm, and he finds a way out. See, the, the salvation that Paul received would cause great hardships for Paul the rest of his life. But I'll also add, when you read his writings, there's a great peace and a great joy that comes in the midst of the persecution because he was doing it for the purpose of serving Jesus. Paul had an attitude that we need to have. No matter what I face, no matter the obstacles that are before me, I'm going to stand firm to Jesus because that's where my, my rock is. That's where my peace and my joy is. I'm not going to turn back. I'm going to focus on Jesus no matter what happens to me. It's a pretty bold statement for us to make. But if you're going to serve Jesus, are you all in? Or as we say on Wednesday night study, are we just a fan of Jesus or are we actually a follower? A follower is ready to go through anything for the cause of Christ. Standing firm. Before we open to Philippians, I want to uh, talk about Paul's history with the Philippians. We learn more of that in Acts 16. It really begins around verse 9. By the way, Silas and Timothy are with Paul at this point. And in Acts 16, 9, in a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And the city of Philippi 
was located in Macedonia. So he sells to Macedonia, and guess what? He ends up in jail. Verse 16, as we were going to a place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Now, let me just say this. I don't believe that this, this girl, this, this demon-possessed girl, is like most of the psychics we have today. I, st- I still believe that that exists, but I was watching TV the other day, and I guess California psychics are better than other psychics because they promote California psychics, and, and, and all they do is they just they, they, they prey on people, right? We know that. But this lady was possessed. She could tell the future. There's no doubt about it. She had understanding, and it brought much wealth to her owners. So there's a spirit. There's a demon. It's just not a con game. There's an actual demon in her. Verse 17, she followed Paul and and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. See, even demons know that. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. So we're seeing Paul in his faith growing, and the power as an apostle of Jesus growing. But the question I've always had, and I've heard people say, you know, he cast this demon out to free this girl. And very likely that was part of the reason. But I read something recently that I thought was pretty profound. It's speculation, but I want, I want to read this to you for what, what this one author said. Uh, he said, simply put, Paul did not need a demonic approval of his work. He did not appreciate the source of the recommendation of demon. Sometimes we look for support in the world. We don't need to worry about the world. We look for support from an individual. We don't need to worry about the individual because guess what? The world's going to let you down. Individuals are going to let you down. Jesus will never let you down. You'll go through difficult times, but he will never let you down. See, Paul knew, and we talked about this in Colossians. Paul knew as he cast this demon out that there's power in the name of Jesus. I just want to point out, when he cast the demon out, he didn't say, I, Paul the Apostle, cast you out, because he couldn't do it. But he could by proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, because there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. We talked about this in Colossians, where Paul's dealing with heresy, where people are taking their eyes off of Jesus, and he gives a long list of how Jesus is second to none. There's not even a, a close second to Jesus. That all you need, remember we said it's like Paul shouting in Colossians, all you need is Jesus. And we see that here. And here's what I will tell you. When you're going through difficult situations, when you don't know where to turn, when your worst fear is reality, when you think that you're against impossible odds, you need to pray in the name of Jesus. When you give thanks for the food at your table, as much food as we can have in this country, we still should give thanks in the name of Jesus because He is the source of everything. And as we found out in Colossians, He holds everything together. And the reason we have food, the reason we have clothing, the reason we have eternal life is all because of Jesus. And we are called to stand firm with a spiritual backbone just like Paul did regardless of the consequences. Verse 19, now if you had the slave girl, now she's free of this demon, you're going to be upset with Paul, and they're upset, Uh, 19. But when her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him into the marketplace before the rulers. Now, that's probably not enough to get him thrown in jail, so they got to figure out what they can do to get him thrown in jail. This is going to describe Philippi here in a minute, the city. And then they had brought him before the magistrates. They said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing the city. Once again, these men are Jews. A hatred towards Jews. Even here today in 2024. 
They are disturbing our city. They advocate, I want you to listen to 21, because we're going to come back to this. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. That is an important statement. That seems like a vague statement to us, but it's an important statement. I'll come back to it in a moment. And because of that statement, the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailers to keep them safe. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they're in the middle of the prison. They've got guards all around them. They're not going anywhere. All because the master saw the, the, her master saw the prophets were gone and became angry with Paul. Called them Jews, threw them in prison. Now, back to 21, the accusation against Paul. He advocates customs that are not lawful for us. Let's, let's understand what those customs were in Philippi. Because the city of Philippi was full of military personnel that had retired. Years before Paul arrived, many of these military personnel were given up to 80 acres of land for their service to the empire of Rome in Philippi, and that's where they called home. It was a patriotic city filled with fervor for Rome. But here comes Paul in the middle of this fervor that's even more so than it is in other places of Rome because the military personnel that dedicated their life to serving the emperor. And here comes Paul talking about Jesus is more important than anything. To a Roman soldier to hear that there's something more important than Rome to more important than, than um, the emperor is treasonous. But yet Paul knows this because he's a Roman citizen, and yet he preaches it anyway. These military veterans and these individuals and their families had tremendous power in Philippi. And they held the emperor in high esteem. Matter of fact, some of them would have worshipped the emperor as a god. History tells us that Caesar himself claimed to be the Lord and Savior to bring peace to the world. This was the mindset of those in Philippi. And here comes Paul, Silas, and Timothy, Jews that are despised, and they're proclaiming that Jesus is king. That statement was made in verse 21. It wasn't a vague statement. It was pointing to them and saying they are treasonous. They are against Rome. And isn't it ironic that Jesus is the only way to salvation and how it got Paul in trouble and here we are today in 2024 and it still causes great consternation in this world when you say Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is king. Everything goes through the love of Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus holds everything together. Everything that we know of, everything that we'll discover, and things we'll never know, that's the Jesus we serve. You either believe it or you don't believe it. And it still causes great consternation today. Later in Acts 16, we find that they're miraculously rescued, but they don't leave and they lead others to... Christ as a result of their incarceration. It's a wonderful story. But back to the letter of Philippians. Once again, as Paul is sitting down to pen this letter to the Philippian church, he finds himself in prison. Not in Philippi this time, not in Macedonia. He finds himself, and, and there's debate, he's either at Ephesus or in Rome. Some other people have other ideas. It doesn't matter, he's in prison. And he's going to write to the Philippian church. And so he's in prison once again. And, and when you look at studies, they'll tell you the years that they believe that Paul was in prison. And most of them around five years at different times Paul was in prison. But while Paul was in prison, you think when you go to prison, you know, we're lock the door and throw away the key, right? So you're of no use anymore. While Paul was in prison, he didn't stop his ministry. When Paul was in prison, he wrote four books of the Bible. Four. 
He wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and also Philippians. And even though he was in prison during this time, he used these books to give some of the most liberating concepts of Christianity because man could put him in jail, but they could never put his spirit and his soul and his hope of Jesus behind bars. He was standing firm no matter what. So when he writes the letter to the Philippian church, he's writing it from prison, and he could likely die as a result of the charges, but he's not concerned about that. He's concerned about the church that he had started in Philippi. A remarkable story. See, I think one of the reasons we celebrate Paul as such a wonderful example, as such a giant in faith, is because he never lost his passion for God's people, even though he was being persecuted. He never lost his passion for God's people when he was being persecuted. That's why I consistently say we all have individual gifts. We all have individual things that we are just really good at that God has gifted us with. But he has called all of us to unique gifts, but he has called all of us in the scriptures, as I've said many times, to serve, to study, and to share the gospel. That's a calling for all of us. And when you are don't know where to turn when you're being persecuted, when, when you've had trouble, like Job had trouble in his life, when you have anxiety, like, like David had times in his life, whether it was your fault or somebody else's fault, one way to overcome it is to focus on Jesus. Matter of fact, the only way to overcome it is to focus on Jesus. And when you focus on Jesus, Jesus, if you even don't feel like it, get up and serve. Get up and study the scriptures. Get up and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and let Satan know you won't be defeated. Philippians 1. One through three. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I'm about to lose my voice. Let me just say this. What we hear in these opening verses is a greeting of peace, a greeting of understanding, a greeting of continual prayer for the Philippians. We don't hear, oh, woe is my life because I'm in prison. We hear joy, we have peace, and we hear a concern through prayer for the Philippians. And that's where we'll begin next week. I'm going to ask the deacons and wives to come forward. are up here and, and their wives are up here. If the Holy Spirit is moving inside of your heart since the very beginning, since the moment that you walked in here, or even before when you woke up this morning and knew that you needed to bring something of yours to the Lord. And when our pastor says that we need to focus on the Lord, we need to give it to the Lord. And what that really means is that I'm not going to concentrate to what's happening to me at this moment. I'm not going to listen to that voice in my head that tells me this is what's going to happen or the woe is me. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is give it to the Lord. And here is an opportunity for you to come to the front and be able to just, Lord, here it is. And when I leave these doors, when I leave this moment, I'm not going to think about those negative thoughts anymore. I'm not going to think about what's going on in my mind anymore. I'm going to concentrate on what God says, who you are in Christ. And so here's an opportunity, church, for you to come forward. Emily, if you'd like to play.
Is there an anxiety that's happening in your life? Is there something in your health that you need to, that overwhelms you throughout the week? Is there some sort of stress that is coming at you? Is it something that might even be de demonic? Come to the front. Our deacons, their wives, they are ready. Come to the front. Cast all your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. Make this the day. Mark this the morning. This is it. Draw a line in the sand and let's give it to God. If you're up here this morning, go ahead and continue praying. But let's go ahead and, and close the service. So if you would stand and join us. Father, thank you for being a holy God. Thank you for being our Father and seeing us as your children. Thank you, Father, because we can come to your throne of grace because we are covered in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, Father, you see us, you hear us, you intervene for us, Lord. And Father, for those who could not come to the front or did not feel, Father, feel the, the need to, Lord, be with them, bless them, make sure that they understand, Lord, move in them, Lord, to know that you are with them. You are the most powerful force in the entire universe, Lord. Thank you for that and for looking and having mercy upon us, Lord. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.